It is so good to be back here at Connection Point, and I'm thankful to John for this opportunity to teach in the series called Be the Best You. One thing I like about Connection Point is I feel like I can just be myself here. And don't you feel that way? I hope you do, that you can just be yourself. But I have to admit, I'm not always my best self. How about it, parents? Are you always your best selves with your kids? When my brothers and I were growing up, I have two brothers. One time, all three of us were wrestling in the house. And all three of us were wrestling so hard, we landed on the bed and the bed broke, the split that old wooden bed frame right down the side. My dad was so mad at us, he was still angry when we got in our cars and drove back to college. <laughs> My brothers and I were not at our best selves that day. How about husbands and wives? Are you your best selves at every moment with your spouse? My wife is a registered nurse. And one time she had worked the night shift as a nurse in a hospital, three 12-hour night shifts in a row. And when she finished that, we went for a walk to catch up on things, and she was really tired, wearing an old t-shirt and jeans, and she hadn't fixed up her hair or put on any makeup. And as we walked along, she said, Dave, I'm sorry I look like such a slob today. And I said, well, that's okay. <laughs> You're realizing why this was not a good thing to say. It was a response that made perfect sense to me in my male brain. But Candy later informed me it would have been a lot better if I had said, Candy, you are beautiful to me no matter what. I wasn't my best self that day. What about in our daily interactions with other people, just out and about in the world? Are you always your best self? I was at an airport getting ready to get on a plane, and I was waiting in the line to go up to the ticket agent, and the person right ahead of me made a big, ugly scene. She got so angry that she was just, it was really nasty, and she was yelling, and the ticket agent was standing there calmly trying to explain to this woman why she could not carry two large, oversized bags onto the plane with her. And the woman just wouldn't accept no for an answer and was making a big, ugly scene. And finally, they got it settled, and I was the next person in line, so I walked up to the counter and I said to the woman, boy, I'm really sorry that you had to deal with whatever that was because it must have been hard to stay calm as you did when somebody's treating you so rudely. And the agent kind of flustered, trying to calm herself down. She said, yeah, and you know what was in those bags the woman wanted to take on the plane? I said, no, what? She said, Bibles. Two bags of Bibles. And this ticket agent said, you'd think that somebody who had two big bags of Bibles with them would act a little better than that, wouldn't you? And I said, ma'am, on behalf of a lot of us who take the Bible very seriously, I'm sorry that you were treated that way. It was a reminder that we do need to be our best selves. As people are watching. And if we want to be successful in our relationship with other people, Jesus summed it up this way in John chapter 13, verse 35. He said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another. People are so in need of being loved. Maybe you heard this just a few weeks ago in Great Britain. They established in England a government office called the Ministry of Loneliness not making this up. It was a news story just a few weeks ago. The Ministry of Loneliness because they said there is an epidemic of loneliness in our country and their way to solve it is to establish a government office. Now, when I heard that, I thought, Jesus has called all of us to be ministers of loneliness, to respond to people with love and caring. And if you were to sum up what healthy, loving relationships with others look like, well, some words that start with A come to my mind. Words like accessibility and awareness, authenticity and accountability. You make yourself accessible to people. You're available to them. You're aware, self-aware, and aware of others' needs, not just in your own little bubble. You are authentic and genuine, not phony and fake. And you are accountable for your own attitude and your own actions. Now, it's amazing how Jesus modeled behaviors like that. In his interaction with people, the way he treated people, the way he dealt with people, 
There's a story in the Gospel of Luke about a time when a man named Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus to, ha- to his house for a dinner, and Jesus showed up, and so did a woman who evidently came uninvited, who was known in the town because she had lived a very sinful life. That's the way it sums it up. So she had a bad reputation. She was sitting at Jesus' feet while he was having dinner with the Pharisee, Simon. And as Jesus taught, something about the way he communicated God's love just overwhelmed her and touched her heart, and she began to cry. She began to weep. And her tears poured down on Jesus' feet and were wetting his feet with her tears. Then, kind of embarrassed, it was an awkward scene, she grabbed the only towel that was available, which was her own long hair. And she started pouring perfume on his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. And Simon the Pharisee, the host, became very annoyed by all this because he had planned a nice, quiet dinner party. And here's this woman messing everything up with all her weeping and wiping and wailing. And so Simon in his head is starting to be very critical of Jesus and of this woman. And he didn't say it out loud, but in his mind he's thinking, if Jesus were really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is, and he wouldn't want anything to do with her. Now Jesus, it says, answered him. Now what's interesting is the the man never spoke these words of criticism out loud. But it says Jesus answered him. In other words, Jesus answered his own unspoken thoughts. And Jesus said, he told him a little story about forgiveness. And then he looked at that Pharisee and he said, do you see this woman? And the truth is that Pharisee may have seen her physically with his eyes, but he did not really see her as a person of value. Simon saw a nuisance. Jesus saw a need. Simon saw a situation to avoid. Jesus saw a chance to help. Simon saw a problem, but Jesus saw a person. What do you see when you look at other people? Do you see this woman? Do you see this man? Do you see this little boy and girl for who they really are? Well, in John chapter 4, as we continue this series from John 3 and 4, we're going to read a very interesting story this morning. It's about the longest recorded conversation that we have of Jesus with any individual in all the New Testament. And it's this story of a woman he encounters beginning in verse 4 of John chapter 4. Here's what it says. Now he had to go through Samaria. He came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, and Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, they started counting time when the sun came up, about 6 a.m. So the sixth hour probably means noon. It was the heat of the day, the middle of the day. It was hot. Jesus was tired. The word there translated tired means something like beaten down. We would say he was beat. He was the son of God, and yet he knows how it feels to be really tired and exhausted. And he was thirsty. And so it says when a Samaritan woman came to draw water... Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Now, most people drew water from the well earlier in the morning or late in the evening when it was cooler. But the fact that this woman came at midday suggests that she may have been trying to avoid interaction with other people. So she came at noon. The Samaritan woman was surprised. She said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now notice a couple things in this passage. In verse 4, it's interesting. Did you catch this? It says he had to go through Samaria. He had to. Now, geographically, technically, he didn't really have to. There was a way to get there to Samaria without going, to get to where he was going, without going through Samaria. See, uh, Judea was down here, down in the south, And Galilee, where Jesus was going, was up here in the north, and Samaria was in between. So the most natural way to get there was to go right up through Samaria. It took about three days to get to Galilee that way on foot. But did you catch that part in verse 9? It says, Jews don't associate with Samaritans. So most Jewish people would say, you know, I don't want to go through Samaria. It might take me six days, but I'm going to go out and go around it. It would be like here in Indiana if we said, you know what? I want to go to Tennessee, but I don't feel like going through Kentucky. And if you had, for some reason, you had something against Kentucky, and you didn't want to, you could get to Tennessee by going way out and around. It wouldn't be the most direct or convenient way, but you could do it. You could bypass Kentucky if you wanted to. 
But the most direct way would be, go, well, when it says he had to go through Samaria, the point is, he didn't have to if he was going to go with the biases and prejudices of most of his people. He would have skipped it. Now, before you're too harsh with the Jewish people here, let me ask you, have you ever traveled a different route because you didn't like going through a certain neighborhood on foot or in car or whatever that it just made you uncomfortable? See, the Jews and the Samaritans despised each other, and they had for years. It went way back in history to the time when the Samaritans intermarried with idol worshipers and mixed pagan ideas with the Hebrew faith, and they built their own temple on a mountain called Mount Gerizim, and they even had their own version of the Bible that only had the first five books of the Old Testament in it. And there was a time in the days of Nehemiah when the Jews were trying to rebuild the wall of their city. And the Samaritans were some of the ones who opposed that. So this animosity went way back. Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria, but he wanted to go. He chose to. He had to because of a relational reason, for a missional purpose, because he wanted to engage with this woman face to face. He wanted to meet this woman face to face. You know, John 3.16 says that God loves the world. But he doesn't just love the world in general. He loves individuals. He loves you. He loved the woman at the well. Jesus intentionally made himself available to her. And that's what Jesus does. He makes God accessible. And listen, folks, he wants to join you at your well. He wants to go there where you work, and to the coffee shop where you hang out. A firefighter doesn't just stand outside a burning building and shout at people. He goes into the building and brings people out. Jesus entered this woman's world. And to do that, to meet with her face to face, he was crossing the religious and racial barriers between Jews and Samaritans. He was crossing a gender barrier because in those days, most Jewish men would not even greet a woman on the street. In fact, there were certain Pharisees known as the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because if they saw a woman on the street, they would shut their eyes and as a result, they would bump into walls and buildings. Jesus crossed that barrier. He crossed social barriers. The rabbis said that you were religiously unclean if you drank from the bucket or the cup of a Samaritan. But Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And he was willing to allow her to help him that way. The woman herself was amazed that Jesus would ignore these prejudices and speak to her in broad daylight. But let me tell you, folks, if you want to build healthy relationships and be successful with others, there's no substitute for FaceTime. Parents, are you given enough real face-to-face -face time with your kids, with your grandkids, with people in your life who really need you to interact with them. It's okay to have boundaries. Jesus himself went off by himself for a while to get away from the crowds, but he made himself accessible, available. Remember the time parents brought their little kids to Jesus and the disciples thought, he's too busy for that, and they tried to shoo everybody away. And Jesus said, no, let the little children come unto me. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus needed to meet with him. He said, okay, let's make a nighttime appointment and we'll talk face to face. Do we see people the way Jesus does? Do we get face to face with the exhausted single mom and have a sense of what she's going through? The little boy who never stops talking. The old man who never says anything. The folks who work in restaurants and stores. They are not machines who perform services for us. They are people with incredible value, with hurts and hopes and dreams and families that they care about? What about the international student who's struggling to learn our culture and our language? What about the person with a mental illness or a physical disability? What about the young professional whose career is on the fast track but whose heart is filled with despair? Are we finding face time with people we can serve in Jesus' name? It's not always easy. My wife is a nurse and one time she was working for a faith-based medical clinic that provided prenatal care to young women. Most of her patients were unwed pregnant teenagers. One day a young woman came into the clinic with a really bad attitude. She was so rude and uncooperative. My wife, who's a very gentle soul, said later that this girl, it, it was so bad, she was so rude and uncooperative that she thought, I'm going to have to punch her in the nose or something. She said, it was just rude. But something inside my wife's heart just said, no. No, look her in the eye, and she did. 
And she said, I told that young woman, it, it seems like you're having a really rough day. And immediately, that hardened young woman burst into tears, and through her sobs, she told Candy how stressful her life was and how she wasn't sure how she could go on. We all run into difficult people, angry people. Can we stop and take the time to pray and say, Lord, what's making them that way? Can we get some face time with them so that we start to see life from their perspective? Years ago, my family led a new church plant in an urban neighborhood. And our church rented a community center and we made a plywood sign. It was really nicely done, real painted up and had you know, the name of the church and the times of the services. And the community center allowed us to keep the sign stored in the basement of the building. So every Sunday morning, I or some of the other volunteers would go and we had to lug that heavy sign up from the basement, carry it out and put it on the sidewalk outside the community center so people would know that our church met there. I hated that sign because it was heavy and on a rainy day, you know, it was just a pain in the neck to put it out there. And there were times in my lack of faith that I would think, is anybody noticing? Is this making any difference? And then one Sunday, I looked in the back row and there was a guy sitting in the back I'd never seen before. He was new. His name was Mike, I found out, and it turns out he lived in the neighborhood. And Mike's story was quite interesting. He was kind of a scary looking guy, to be honest. He was a very burly guy, he was a military veteran who worked as a dental hygienist at a city health clinic. And he wore t-shirts and shorts all year round, no matter what the weather, no matter how cold it was, it was 20 below zero, he would show up with a t-shirt and shorts on. You didn't mess around with Mike. And I found out, as I got to know him, that he lived in the neighborhood, and on Sunday mornings, he would drive out to the suburbs to play golf, but on his way out, he would see this sign sitting on the sidewalk, and it bugged him. He was curious, why is our community center allowing some church to meet there? And so he came to check us out, and eventually, he became a Christian. He accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. He was baptized, and I got to know Mike as a person, and you know what? He came every week early because he had a special ministry. You know what his job was? He went in the basement and got the sign, and he'd carry it out and put it on the sidewalk. I, I loved that guy. <laughs> I was so grateful for him. <laughs> but he wanted other people to see the sign that had made a difference for him. He died of cancer in his 60s way too soon, but not before making a big difference for the Lord and for me. Mike was my friend, but it took time to get to know him face to face. You want know what, folks? Jesus wants face time with you. He wants to join you at your well. And when you are sitting by yourself at the coffee shop or you're taking care of a sick family member or you're dealing with a bully at school or you're alone in your apartment or your life is a mess and you don't know where to turn, Jesus knows and he cares and he wants to sit down next to you. And have face time with you. And another thing we see about Jesus' interaction with this woman, he not only met with her face to face, but he also engaged with her mind to mind. You know, sometimes people have this wrong idea that when you become a Christian, you throw your brains out the window and you just somehow believe all these unreasonable things. That's not it at all. Jesus has a way of calling us to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. This woman was smart. And Jesus doesn't let people kind of get by with shallowness and settle for that. Jesus called her to engage her mind and think deeply with him. And one thing he did was he awakened her spiritual thirst. As we read on in this story in verse 10, Jesus answered her. She said, how can you ask me for a drink? I'm a Samaritan woman. We usually wouldn't even be having this conversation. Jesus said in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? She's being a little sarcastic, I think. She's saying, well, that's real nice, all this talk about living water. You don't even have a bucket. You're the one asking me for water, and you're saying you can give me living water? What do you mean by that? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? Who do you think you are? And this well is really deep. You know, if you go to Israel to this day, they will show you Jacob's well. And it's about 100 feet deep. It's very deep, especially for those days. That's a long way to drop down your bucket and pull the water out. So she's thinking about physical water. 
But Jesus answered in verse 13, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Folks, we're all spiritually thirsty. There is a God-shaped hole in our hearts that nothing can fill but God. And we try to fill it with work and hobbies and money and entertainment and all kinds of things, but nothing else can satisfy the thirst that we have except the Lord. And so Jesus stirred that spiritual thirst in her, and then he challenged her personal life. This was another thing that he did. Verse 16, Jesus told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now keep in mind that Jesus had just met this woman. But he knew everything about her. The Lord can read us like a book. I heard about a little girl who was listening to the preacher in church, and she leaned over and whispered to her mother, Mom, how does he know what goes on in our house? But it wasn't that the preacher is so smart. It's just that God's word speaks to us as we really are. A friend of mine used to serve in the state police, and he would ride in a helicopter and use radar to clock the cars down below. And he said, it's an odd feeling to look down and see some guy breezing down the highway at 95 miles an hour and he has no idea that you're up here clocking his speed and holding him accountable for his driving. He has no idea you're watching. The Bible says in Hebrews, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Jesus knew the details of this woman's life. But by bringing this stuff out, he wasn't being harsh or condemning toward her. She had been through a lot, and Jesus saw this woman as she really was. She had had five husbands. Now, it's possible she had been widowed five times, but it seems way more likely she had been divorced and remarried over and over and over again. Either way... This woman had endured a lot of heartache. It's likely she had been mistreated by men. And now she was living with a man who had not committed herself, himself to her in marriage. And that is not the way things work best in God's design. Now please understand my heart in this. God does not give us rules to make our lives miserable. His commands are not burdensome, the Bible says. But God wants to protect our hearts. Living together and having sexual relationships outside of marriage is not what's best for us. God designed marriage to be a bond of love and mutual trust and commitment and respect between one man and one woman. You miss these blessings when you give your heart and your body to someone who has not fully committed themselves to you. This woman had experienced one painful relationship after another. I can't help but wonder if each time she married, she thought, this is the guy. This time I'll be happy. And each time she ended up disappointed and heartbroken. It's so tempting to think, if you can just find the right relationship, you'll be happy. So you jump from one person to another, hoping this time things will be different. But no human relationship can fill that hole in your heart. No human relationship can satisfy your spiritual thirst. Jesus was treating her with respect and challenging her to think. We want the doctor to tell us the truth because that's what it takes to get well. And Jesus models for us here that we can show compassion without compromise. We can love deeply and challenge honestly at the same time. So Jesus challenged the Samaritan woman to think clearly about her personal life. And how would you feel if you were in her sandals... And this stranger is telling you all these intimate, personal details about your life. In verse 19, she said, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. I can tell that you have divine insight. How do you know so much about me? I don't know, but your words are getting too close for comfort now. So I'm going to change the subject. Verse 20, she says, all kind of out of the blue, all of a sudden she says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She changes the subject. And Jesus used this as an opportunity. He declared in verse 21, 
Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He's not going to just settle for talking about some religious argument. He wants to sharpen her relationship with God. That's what he's concerned about. She's trying to drag this off on another, on another topic. Do you ever get into a conversation with somebody and then when things get a little too close to home, they just want to argue about some religious thing? Well, Protestants and Catholics, well, they don't get along. Or why do some churches use organs and pianos and some use drums and guitar? Is that really what God's after? Jesus didn't dodge her question, but he didn't want to dwell there. He says in verse 22, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. So on that point, the Jews are actually closer to the truth, he's saying. But the point is, verse 23, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. What Jesus is saying is worshiping God is about our hearts. It's about spirit and truth, not just going through the motions, not just going through empty religious rituals. He's saying, is your heart really in it? Are you engaging with the spirit of God? Are you serious about the truth that he has revealed? This became clearer to this woman as Jesus encountered her face to face and mind to mind. But you see all that this interaction is about is also a heart to heart connection that he was making with this woman heart to heart remember those words that start with a that we began with this morning jesus did all those things he made himself accessible to the samaritan woman went out of his way to be with her he was aware of her needs he was authentic and transparent with her and in a loving way he held her accountable and then this woman says verse 25 well, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. She was saying that to Jesus. She was saying, you know, I know that there's a Messiah, a deliverer, a redeemer coming, a savior coming, and she's saying it to Jesus. You hear the hope that she's searching for, the longing that she has, and Jesus responds, verse 26, I who speak to you am he. What a bold claim that he just lays it out there for this woman at the well. I am the Messiah. I'm the hope giver. I'm the one who has promised to come and redeem and deliver you. Folks, everybody you talk to is looking for Jesus, whether they know it or not. They are looking for the hope that only he can bring. I read an article recently by a man who lives near Seattle, Washington, if you go to Seattle, on a sunny day, you can see Mount Rainier out there. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. But so much of the year, it's kind of cloudy and rainy and drizzly out there. And it's often hard to see the mountain. And the author says that the key if you live out there is, even on the cloudy days, you've got to live like the mountain is out. And I saw that and I thought, that's like God's love. Because you go through a lot of cloudy days, but the mountain of God's love is always there even when you can't see it. And with this woman who'd been through so many cloudy days and rough experience and failed relationships, whatever she had been through, the mountain of God's love was still there. If we're going to be successful in our relationships with others, we've got to meet with people face to face, mind to mind, and heart to heart, and introduce them to Jesus, who is the one true hope giver. In every season of life, he's the one who brings us hope. My mom, in January of this year, had a massive stroke. She was 89 years old, just one month short of her 90th birthday. They took her to the hospital, and my wife Candy and I stayed in there in the hospital room with her for a few days, and then the doctors and nurses uh, gave us the bad news that she wasn't going to make it. And it was sad to us because we knew her so well, knew what kind of woman she was. We had seen her as she really was. But when the doctors and nurses and social workers and so on, they were very kind and they were professional. But when they would walk into the room, it was sad to us because we knew they were just seeing a frail old lady with a face that had been made crooked by a stroke who couldn't talk or walk. But we saw 
a young girl who wanted to live in a big city and work in the business world, but after World War II ended, at age 18, she married a farmer, my dad. And even though she didn't want to live on the farm, she spent her whole adult life living on the farm, raising sons and serving the Lord along with her husband. That's what we saw. We saw a woman who had raised three boys and rubbed Vicks VapoRub on our chests when we got sick. That's what we saw. We saw a musician who played keyboards at church. We saw a cook who was famous for her making her homemade noodles. And she would roll them out by hand with a rolling pin to just the right thickness and cut them to just the right width, and they tasted so good. My mom is famous for her noodles. And a few days before she had her stroke, I was visiting her in the nursing home where she had moved, and they brought her a bowl of noodles for lunch. I said, oh, wow, noodles, that's perfect for you. And she said, Dave, can I tell you something? I said, what? She said, truth is, I've never liked noodles. <laughs> I said, what? You're famous for your noodles. How could you not? She said, no, I never really liked them. And you know what I realized? All those years, she didn't make them for herself. She was making them because we liked them. That's who I saw lying there in the hospital bed. And when the doctors came in and said that she was going to die, my mom was lying there listening to them, and I asked my mom, did you hear what they said? She went, I said, are you at peace? She nodded. And somehow she mustered up the strength to say, thank you. The last two words I heard my mom say. Thank you. She kept a little diary in the nursing home where she had moved, and two days before her stroke, she wrote on this little pad, I am happy in my new home. And I want to tell you, I am sure that she's even happier in the home she's now in. If you had walked into my mom's hospital room, you might have seen just a frail old woman with a face made crooked by a stroke. But Jesus saw her as she really was. Just like he saw the woman at the well. And just like he sees you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for seeing us and loving us as we really are. For going out of your way to meet with us. Especially we see that at the cross. Where your son Jesus suffered and died giving of himself sacrificially so that we could be restored to a healthy relationship with you. Lord, in our interactions with other people, help us to follow the example of Jesus, to find time to meet with people face to face, mind to mind, heart to heart. Help us, God, to be effective witnesses for your love and grace, even as that woman went on to go back and leave her water jar at the well and go back and tell her friends in town, come and meet this man. Lord, there are people in our lives we need to introduce to Jesus. Help us to do that with integrity, authenticity, with grace and truth. Bless us, Lord, to take this message and apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.